Hello everyone, today we talk about the Carolingian ecclesiastical reform and you will say, oh no, Schwerpunkt, another one of those ecclesiastical history videos that nobody watches. Yes, because you must watch it instead, because these are important things, always important things. Um, we never even talked too much about that and today I would like to introduce also the figure of Benedict of Anian that probably will come back on, it's one of those um, crucial figures, in fact, not just in the Carolingian ecclesiastical reform, but in this broader pan-European um, court and empire uh, of the Carolingians that, as you know, drew people from all over the empire, in this case from Septimania, so the Visigoth, there were uh, Anglo-Saxons, there were Longobards next to the Franks, um, e etc. And this um, reform, as you remember also, if you're a regular follower from the videos we made about the Carolingians in general, and many about uh, Carolingian ecclesiastical power per se, without in fact talking about the reform in general, um, hem, highlight the, um, the, the cruciality of the reform for establishing essentially um, a, a, a continuous institutional stability to the secular government itself because the Carolingian Empire was fundamentally founded on this military clientels that were made up by the local lay nobility of course also the ecclesiastics uh, the, the clergy had um, a great importance in this even from a military point of view you know that the Carolingians obliged the uh, the abbots and the bishops to at least lead their own uh, contingents up to the front line um, during the the habitual campaigns that every year and even multiple times during it, during it were waged against the various uh, peoples that rebelled here and there or even just to conquer new ones um, and we have already seen in fact how how much overlapping existed between the lay and the ecclesiastical elites because they were fundamentally the same people uh, as we will see now even with Benedict of Anian he was actually uh, the son of a count and he didn't uh, think even at the beginning to become uh, a monk and an abbot uh, and also to become fundamentally the most uh, influential person in the in the Carolingian monastic reform, almost uh, a second Benedict of Nursia, the, the name there, it's not also a coincidence in many ways, um, and how, in fact, the same Carolingian church and monastic system also were partly different, of course, because we're talking about two different things. I mean, the secular clergy is not the um, monks, etc., but uh, we're indeed drawn from in part the same private elite that had made up the, the, lay, uh, the lay government, the lay aristocracy. And this brought to some problems because the ecclesiastical reform was not enough to establish a, um, a permanent stable continuous power that the government would solely rely on fundamentally to, or at least satisfactorily rely on to rule uh, the empire. But we also know very well how in the West, and throughout the same time, uh, objectively and later on in post-Carolingian kingdoms and also outside Carolingian world, uh, in Christendom, the church backed lay power consistently. At some point it also became antagonistic, but fundamentally the existence of a lay and ecclesiastical power was essentially the sap, uh, as we were, were recalling the other day even in that comparison between the uh, Carolingians and the, uh, the Umayyads of the this important Frankish Latin Germanic um, gestation I would say of uh, Western civilization right it was slower but more complex kind of more patient in a way and more uh, thorough and uh, methodic and systematic and um, the Carolingian Empire had brought together, as we were saying in the beginning, lots of uh, talents, 
people coming from all the corners of the empire, the very elite, the intelligentsia. And this uh, circulation of men and of ideas naturally managed to succeed in the measure in which the ecclesiastical institutions function within themselves and in the relation with the royal power correctly. As we were saying that video again with Umayyad, it's a great deal of you know this um, this very gradual state building occurred because of the same antagonism between the state, let's say, and the church. That the the, the separation of which in in Western civilization is immediate. We don't have to await the uh, Treaty of Westphalen, the, the religious freedoms being sanctioned and fundamentally the confession that the church is properly separated from the state in, in a formal sense. This is contained in in the Gospels already, right? And it's something there also stemming apart from Judaic tradition and so on, in, in practice especially. And um, in many instances at least which was some which is something that from one side took away this enormous amount of mm, properly administrative capacity i mean the clergy was literate this was the thing you can't really have a state without administration etc which in the umayyad empire for example did not exist right it well, everything was under the lay even if you can't in Islam, you can't quite talk about that per se because it's always gods, and and that's it's mixed all together. But factually, right, it, it was the secular world controlling everything and essentially channeling every effort in the in this macro expansion that, however, didn't have on the long run much to substantiate to when the empire, the, the caliphate, crumbled, right, territorially, politically, as soon as the the conquest. Uh, reached its uh, its limit, and um, conversely, uh, the and and because, however, it, it could be uh, it, it could happen because there were hell of public structures of mostly Roman legacy in in continental Europe. These structures had fundamentally decayed. Uh, to the irreparable in certain cases. In fact, the Saint Carolingian ecclesi ecclesiastical reform is. Um, what was necessary simply because also of the appalling level of Christian literacy in uh, in Central Europe, right? We know some areas like Bavaria at the time of you know before the, the reform, Pippinian times, let's say, had clergy that couldn't even read Latin. They were essentially inventing the meaning of the Bible, um, and this, of course, could not be the premise that. that reflected the the very still primitive and and you know uh, just developing still uh, archaic in that case mostly properly germanic structures in central europe that had never quite had anything to stand on their feet from that statal point of view administratively etc and that the roman legacy and the broader frankish you know power management had contributed to expand definitely but that were still inefficient hence the carolingian reform that um, naturally pointed to homogeneity to standardization this can be observed uh, also in the lay reforms and always however pairing the lay officer official with the one uh, with the clergy uh, one ecclesiastic one the the missy you know, um, so um, this this um, this work, right? Trying to make a church work in places where this had never even quite really worked satisfactorily in a world that up to a few generations ago was fundamentally borderline pagan, right? Gregory the Great complains that still at the beginning of the seventh century, the Franks, as Christians, carried out human sacrifice. That is. You know the usual uh, prisoner slaughter to gratify God essentially, and uh, this would happen in many other situations. Like even in much later times, what what is a human sacrifice exactly? Right, you know, just killing prisoners in a certain fashion, or uh, 
attributing to this a sort of you know sacrificial nature for for satisfying God's pleasure in many ways it's intrinsic also in the same bloodshed by a certain degree and especially in Frankish society that's another another side of the story the Carolingians as you know were fond of the Old Testament and all the battles and all the bloodshed and the God lords of battles etc so that they didn't even they, they were more in tune with the Old rather than the New Testament that was more complicated for them to, to assimilate but they would and at this point times were mature as the Empire had re-expanded uh, the Frankish church had rain uh, forced, let's say, the traditional bonds that had always maintained with, with the papacy since Merovingian times, uh, and I'm um, talking about the, the Frankish church, and um, in, in this process there was a huge um, acculturation of the Frankish world, right, that is reflected in, especially in this great enlightened sovereigns like Charlemagne and Louis de Pius, right? The Carolingians, the, the Arnold things, Pepinets had made their empire in, in, in blood, right? Necessarily, like most empires, cannot exist otherwise. In, at, in Charlemagne's times, in Louis de Pius' times, it was the moment of the, okay, we achieved this, we got it, we, ha we are stable enough, let's try to consolidate further. As you know, uh, at the end of the 9th century, the Carolingian Empire was no more. But there were massive um, efforts, first of all, to keep the standing also through the ecclesiastical structures, and especially it was an enormous cultural legacy stemming exactly, especially from the monastic reforms. Not, not just that, but you know that includes also the, the script, for example, the one that would still use. Uh, in the West and beyond, and um, and all stems from from here, from this moment of great effort, where these minds were properly called to decide on issues that would have influenced the world, from Brittany to Monte Cassino, from from the Elbe to to Barcelona, right? Um, and it's exactly the prestige that culture came to acquire in this time that contributed um, often uh, to the promotion of characters of, of, of the highest profile right, in the government of the religious institutions. And um, the appointment method varied. Sometimes it was the same clergy and monastic communities that determined such choices because of the traditional ecclesiastical autonomy and immunities and power. Other times, or and or at the same time, such um, uh, choices were decided or conditioned, let's say, by royal intervention. Because the great advantage of ecclesiastical structures, you can uh, that uh, the offices would last for a lifetime, then somebody else had to be elected. And while there was um, nepotism, clientelism of, of, of any sort, as you can imagine, still it was much easier to influence who would, uh, and the election of those who would uh, rule on this important, massive episcopal and monastic assets than the equally massive lay ones that instead were administered by individuals who thought once they received that benefit and that it was fundamentally some kind of private possession and that were also more militarily uh, inclined so it was more complicated also to dislodge them from from those lands um, and it was a cul de sac in many ways because as you know there was no other way to build the empire um, but uh, recompensating your military clientels with land and then you know once they settled there and you know the empire had overstretched finishing you know the the strategic uh let's say options to you know of uh, of expansion for feeding the clientels with new lands and making them compete for that rather than for internal power well the, the empire would collapse but the church was different and the church could also expand once 
the church expanded, their immunities and privileges were were considered to, if not untouchable, but still fun, virtually so, because you know interfering in them would have complicated enormously the relation with the with the church, with the papacy, with with all that that entailed. But still, that was better than nothing, right? In a world that again knew just essentially the lay model up to that point, or even if that wasn't the lay model, still also the bishops uh, lived in kind of a lay fashion without too much difference from, from the others. Hence, also, a, a reform of the customs and of morality that was felt importantly at the time, just as it should be today, in order to keep things together, right, to have this additional force uh, stemming from a rational understanding that keeping the system together actually is everybody's advantage and disgregating it is just detrimental and uh, a huge problem, especially when uh, you know there is at least an opportunity to really make things work on the basis of what already exists, right? It, that took so much work to, to make function. I mean, Carolingian administration logistics were impressive. They were all basically military oriented, but they worked. Without that, the Franks would have not taken over the entire thing. So it, it took really a great effort to, to do this. was mostly done by the sword, but it was worth preserving also morally. So that need of order that had inspired the uh, reform, also back in the day at the time of Boniface, at Winfred, we've seen the uh, the story at the time of you know of Pippin of Herstal, etc., with Frisia, and all the enormous importance, in fact, that the Church had had in securing also the newly conquered territories to mission, etc., in areas that were still fundamentally pagan. Um, continued to operate in the full Carolingian era because there were still pagans to convert, think about the Saxons, but mainly there was this broader imperfection and disorganization and heterogeneity in the ecclesiastical administration of the various lands, right? And, and st stabilizing the frontier in order to also allow further assets, estates to expand, to be secured, was a great issue, right? Some lands up to that point had not had that possibility because they were threatened by some neighboring powers. Think about the creation of the the Austrian march after the destruction of the Avar Kaganate. Bavaria, where see, a lot of the pictures here are plotted also stem from, uh, benefited enormous for foundations as for the sake properly of um, of this reform but in a broader consequence of political stabilization of the land right by the way the pictures I uploaded here aside from the art um, it's uh, all the buildings mostly are all of these churches are uh, of course uh, Romanesque or I avoided to insert Gothic because it's really too late but say they're all um, Carolingian founded originally, right? So look at the variety of places. Of, think about the the vastness of this reform, of this planning, right? Of this broader effort to endow these monasteries of wealth that could be secured also by the lay aristocracies in support of the state and so on for themselves at the same time. Um, this this centers would be a great point of reference. Right? The um, connective fabric of post-Carolingian Europe culturally, right? We owe Europe so much because of that, right? And so, um, in the moment in which he said a lay authority as forms of greater empire and uh, monarchies had collapsed. Right, these centers of culture made it. So the conciliatory canons, so the deliberation of the councils that were mostly summoned by royal power in Gaul, the Franks had uh, all a tradition of this, and the Carolingian 
capitularies, so the royal legislation, always insist, right, uh, a lot, right, on the ecclesiastical discipline. They cared really much on the, they insisted on the behavior of the man consecrated to religious life, on the exactness of the liturgical functions and of the sacramental rites, and equally they prescribed the laymen the fragmentation of the churches, the payment to the churches of uh, tithe, of all the products of human labor, transforming customs that were already uh, existing, right? Uh, or, you know, uh, at worst, let's say, only sanctioned in the, the conciliar canons, in rigorously coactive norms, right? Uh, the, the tithe was destined in part, usually only one-fourth, to the Episcopal Church, in part to the parish, that um, generally being proposed to one of the ecclesiastical districts uh, in which the Episcopal diocese was articulated had uh, by itself in the district the baptismal rites and the function of religious control of the population, right? And the part reserved to the usages of such parish had to serve to maintenance of the holy building and of the clergy that officiated, and to the relief of uh, the faithful afflicted by the most serious poverty. Um, and in the ecclesiastical norm, especially uh, some councils summoned by Louis the Pius in um, in Aachen, in the in the Carolingian capital, let's say, assume particular relevance in order to admonish the officiating the cathedrals and the parishes to dwell, to live, reside as the canonics in clusters destined to their common life and in order to induce the monks to uniform to the rule of Saint Benedict that was already largely spread, as you know, but with interpretation ever more uh, diluted, in a sense, and that only at this point uh, w being imposed all over the empire with this energetic recall to its uh, originary um, severity. We, we can't say. So the, the canonics we're talking about here are, are those clergymen that live according to a series of ecclesiastical norms that is in fact the canons, uh, either around uh, a bishop such as in the cathedral chapter or in uh, autonomous communities that are out there on their own. The missionary Boniface stimulated the imitation of the canonics in the monastic life um, that was eventually contemplated by the rule of the Bishop Crodegang of Metz in the, in the 8th century and that was re-elaborated and uh, put uh, in, in the circle in the years of Louis uh, the Second, Louis the Pius. So this aspect as we've seen, backed dramatically the moral needs of the same clergy. Uh, that was required an ever more uniform and thus strict discipline as the pretty lax one that had already existed. You see, uh, there is no such thing like uh, anything different in the West than the than St. Benedict's rule. All monks at this point think themselves, you know, were in another, like, uh, you know, following um, the Nursian rule, uh, but as we were saying before, also the, the means of interpretation and how this had declined in the various areas of, of covered by the Carolingian Empire now could, could, could vary really wildly, right? 
So that's where Benedict of Anian comes into, play, into place because he was the figure that essentially worked initially autonomously. We will see how, but also uh, supported later on by the same imperial authority. So much he become he became fun fundamentally the counselor of um, both Charles the Great and Louis the Pious. And he uh, his name was Vitiza, right? Benedict is the one of uh, as a monk, right? And Vitiza is Vitigius. It's a typical Gothic name. He was son of uh, Agilulf, the Count of Magellan, in Septimania. He was born at the time, still a Pippin the Short, uh, and uh, he lived through uh, the times of Charlemagne and Louis the Pius. Septimania, as you know, was this stripe of land uh, in the Mediterranean, in southwestern Gaul, the frontier area with, with the Iberian Peninsula, so-called because it was allegedly crossable in seven days, is a name that acquired since late Roman times, was one of the single most Romanized areas uh, in Europe, it was essentially Visigothic, heavily Visigothic in culture, hence also uh, Vitiza, uh, and at the time also in very intense contact with Muslim Spain. Mm -hmm. So an area that, as you know, will uh, emanate an enormous amount of uh, knowledge, especially in the areas of Occitane, right? Also, Gerbert of Aurillac, uh, later on, uh, protagonist of another, let's say, if not reform, but properly reuniformation and homogenization of the church, also with a broader universal ambition, was formed with a universal culture. Um, Vitiza was, as we were saying at the beginning, not really going for the ecclesiastical career. He followed Charlemagne's army during the Longobard invasion of Italy in 774, uh, when Vitiza was about to die, um, falling in the, the Ticino River at, uh, in, in Pavia, where the, 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 the Franks had arrived there after having you know, besieging it as the Longobard capital, the, essentially the, uh, was the, the longest siege in Carolingian warfare. And on that occasion, some say because of that he was about to drown, uh, other times because his brother died and this uh, struck him particularly, he decided to become a monk. And so he began to tour a bit Europe here, he uh, went first in Dijon, um, then in uh, the Novaleza, uh, and he was initially disappointed with the, say, temper of Car the Carolingian um, monastic environment. That at this point, in fact, you know, was not reformed yet, as he would become actually the reformer of later on, and that's where he came back in uh, in uh, Septimania. At this point, he was monk with the name of Benedict, and in in one of his paternal lands, Anyan, he founded a monastery on his own. Now, at that time, the king of Aquitaine, because of the repartition among Charlemagne's children, was Louis the Pious, who was actually quite interested in Benedict's work, because essentially... Um, the monk was, uh, the abbot at this point, was, was um, experimenting um, a never more mm, orthodox um, uh, rediscovery, let's say, of the Benedictine rule, uh, very much concentrated properly on the office, religious office and the work, um, also reducing the speculative dimension, the intellectual work, and insisting on the completion that uh, Benedict of Norse's rule entailed, per se. In fact, at that time he was also working at, um, at the collection of all the various rules uh, that had existed 
monastically in Christendom, he made a sum of 24 of them, and by confronting them, uh, he came to the conclusion that St. Benedict's one was fundamentally the the perfect one, was the condensation, was the perfect synthesis, in a sense, of all the previous Christian experiences, and he applied this concept to his own rule, to his own monastery. Um, so, when, uh, well, he was already, uh, Louis de Pius took him under his wing, and so this was still in Charlemagne's times, um, and uh, such high position naturally also owed, as we were saying before, to his to the prestige of his own family, also the importance of that Septimania had had at that point, considering that the Carolingians had waged, as you know, important campaigns in the south. Um, we were looking just at the Duchy of Basconia the other day. That it's on the other side. Okay, it's on the Atlantic, but it's closer t to that. Also, the creation of the Spanish bark. So Septimania was ever more important. Was also an importantly fortified area that had important cities and so on. Um, so um, the um, uh, Benedict became, as an abbot, a fur f uh, further founder of of monasteries and he became a close collaborator of Louis de Pius first and after that he uh, that uh, the Carolingian would uh, come to to the Empire and it's in fact in Charlemagne's time that he spread the rule of Saint Benedict further in Aquitaine the Aquitaine still ruled by Louis de Pius and later on when Louis was emperor, was called at his court, and he promoted the acceptation uh, of the rule all over the empire that made it fundamentally the broader monastic reform of the Carolingian era. Right, Louis de Pius is called like this also because of this important, um, in fact, uh, insistence and concern and interest towards this the ecclesiastical reform as more or less warlike uh, ruler than especially, well, his father, but in general, in that situation of the empire, that as we've seen, needed to be now, uh, now that it was created, tried to be kept together, but in Louis times, as you know, he would be dethroned by his own children that are incidentally saying once we would split the empire later, so the thing didn't last enough, but the reform did. Right, was a dramatic homogenization of the practice, an increase of discipline, much greater cooperation also between the church and the empire. Mm -hmm. uh, Benedict, um, at this point, um, achieved his result thanks to the to the charisma he had uh, as an intelligent individual, but working hard in the various councils that were held in various heirs of the empire to propose and obtain the acceptation in counts in these councils in fact under the uh, imperial supervision by the rest of, of the clergy. Benedict would, was also active in the field of orthodoxy countering uh, heresies such as adoptionism that was risking to spread from the uh, from the essentially Visigothic lands ruled by the Arabs at the time that consisted, um, as you know, in this uh, idea that um, uh, fundamentally God has chosen Christ as a, um, as a missionary rather than somewhat, according to this heresy, would have had a um, lesser uh, power than the one of the Father. And so this was a heresy that risked to spread, it was probably connected to the ancient, um, to the ancient um, Arianism that had perhaps survived in some I Visigothic islands still within within Islam, with some probably broader influxes from from the latter as well. But it also reflected an intrinsic issue that had taken place between the Roman Church, that at that point was the one effectively. Um, directing also the, you know, the, the the Carolingian reform, and the um, 
in fact, the Visigothic Church that had actually already compromised in those times uh, with Rome because, you know, the, the Visigothic Church with the Council of Toledo all had its own rituals. It was even antagonistic to the one of Rome. Well, the Visigoths were crushed by, by the Muslims and when the Visigothic refugees and other uh, Christians of the north were about to be crushed by by the Cordobans, they made this deal with, with the papacy. They would have accepted the Roman right in exchange for support. That began, in a sense, also the same Reconquista because there were coordinated efforts to spread further uh, Christianity according to the Roman right in, in Spain and financing military operations. The St. Carolingians intervened there. So, um, the, Benedict's proximity to Visigothic affairs was very important um, culturally, and it helped to stem probably the, this idea that also among men like him that were Visigoths with an important... Uh, I, I call them Visigoths because, again, o Occitane, like the southern half of France, had mostly f fallen in spite of the, uh, the Frankish conquest of those lands historically in the Visigothic and Roman, heavily Romanized um, areas of the Mediterranean. And so there were lots of other, say, Carolingian monks and um, clergymen like him who were probably, mm, you know, resenting of the, say, um, being influenced by, by that idea, still bringing it with them for some kind of traditional national issue against the northern you know, the, the Franks, rulers, and um, that could undermine, in that sense, uh, the same universal imperial Carolingian policy in Europe, right? So it was very important for a figure like him, who came exactly from that background, to stand firm against that spread. Because um, this, um, as you know, the Carolingian reform was nurtured, uh, fueled also by this important Southern European, mostly Italic, um, Roman, um, you know, injection of older, you know, uh, of Roman legacy administratively in, in literacy, etc., and especially the papal support, the ecclesiastical, uh, the cult properly the enormous cultural legacy in uh, in orthodoxy, in uh, con conciliar affairs, in in canon uh, law, etc., that came from the south to the north, right? Think about Charlemagne's also need to create as a secular, in parallel, properly a, a new Rome in Aachen, right? Uh, a capital built in, uh, this palace is built in, in stone, or something enormous for for the Transalpine uh, lands. And so um, this flux from, from the southeast axis was solid. There weren't heresies coming from, from Italy. But the Iberian influence was important as well because that was, as we've seen, a, another great era, uh, area of culture. And uh, the Arabs were bringing further also the, the enormous Hellenic Roman legacy in, in, the, in the great capitals of the south, etc. And so uh, that southwestern axis instead would always remain actually even the, the most active in a strictly theological philosophical point of view because as you know even later on transposing the uh you know the same lens and the same axis in in, in another time it's like still aristotle mandated by avicenna was spreading in the universe you know the theological faculty in Paris, that was the most important of Europe. So that connection between Gaul, between France and Spain, would remain very importantly also for all, all the rest of Europe as the mm, most important channel to mediate, especially philosophical, scientific knowledge. Right? That eventually the West would integrate theoretically in a, in a, in fact, in a systematic fashion for its own uh, mechanism. So. Um, it was about trying to hold the unity of the empire through the unity of the same church. And again, while the lay mechanisms failed in the end, Carolingian history, their ecclesiastical ones did not, because the uniformity brought by the 
let's say, Benedictine re-reform um, in, uh, in, in the Carolingian lands was, um, is at the base of that uniformity, of that homogeneity, of that commonality, of that common identity that post-Carolingian Europe maintains to, to, to this day um, as properly that point of share the point of reference in shared culture in shared language in shared script even in in the idea that there there is a a, a universal imperial reality of the west that can fundamentally relate to each other in moral scientific terms to survive political institutional crises of all sort and that made it true the millennia in such fashion Right, and and this is all the more striking, considering that, as we were saying before, again, these are very few centuries after the fall of the Roman Empire. I mean, if you think about how primitive and archaic these times are, and how just recently some areas of Europe, uh, like Central Europe, most of Carolingian one, especially in the east, but don't think that Gaul was that dramatically more advanced, especially in the north, had never existed. Right again, uh, the the idea even of of, um, of a script of a, a common written culture was, was a huge deal. In northern France, as you know, the oral tradition was something more habitual than the the lands known in the south as the the, the, the ones of written law. Um, for not talking about the just newly conquered German lands. Uh, that had never practically had any of that in form of broader, even just stable, permanent um, state of systems, right? And so the fact that this succeeded and that we can have, as we often pointed out just recently, commenting on the Renovazio Imperi, actually Eastern Francia becoming the center of the empire, managing eventually to reunite with Italy at that point, also with France managing to recompact, becoming the largest power in Europe later on, all stems from this basis and from this reform and from the support that ecclesiastical power gave to lay authority through these means, through the found it, that were very powerful ones. It was foundations of, of an enormity of monasteries all over Europe that were witnessing the sharing of all the knowledge of the experience of all the script communication people as we've seen that came at the carolingian court from everywhere contributing with their own knowledge their own culture their own all to the point of uh let's say of creating a stable power a universal power something that people could rely on right and that could efficiently administer the work as they told. Um, so this reform engineered some changes, some some mechanisms that would start automating themselves um, and standing on their feet even when the, the same authorities that had patronized the same reform were gone. And that not only, but that they contributed to keep alive and to reform again later on right and so this is extraordinary because um, also the same idea of the the u the, the full un uniformation of of the benedictine rule standards all over europe is, is crucial again because benedictines um you know uh, the rule had spread mostly yes had spread right it, it had started from italy from had been even in there patronized by by the papacy it spread in the in, in the longobard kingdom later also also in the frankish lands but again it was not uniform there had never been a single reform that had you know spread this everywhere with the same standards there had been other rules think about the one of saint columba there were other experiments of that kind it was all the irish um, Gaelic and the later Anglo-Saxon Anglo influence that also was was really a thing, especially the same Boniface that we mentioned before, 
for example, uh, came from that background and, uh, and it's considered the pattern of, of Germany today, right? And yet, the Benedictine rule eventually took over all the system. And, and as you know, also the Benedictine rule is pretty simple, but yet, yet effective, right? And also, I think it, the, the spread of it was limited in, in those same lands of the far west of Europe, you know, the same Iberian Peninsula that was living throughout uh, through other experiences, even though it was present there as well. But uh, again, the u uniformation of the creation of a common European fabric passes through this, because uh, it's not before the Carolingians conquer effectively most of uh, of Europe, of Western Europe at the time, and, and will uh, will set these standards also for for their own successor states to expand their own culture further. There was nobody who could uniform Western European culture. I mean, scripts were all different. The Anglo-Saxons had their insular one, the uh, Gaul had the, the Merovingian one, the Visigoths had the, their ones, the Longobards had their ones. They all even just wrote in different way. And it's a problem when you want to create a universal empire. People don't really understand each other even in script or maybe they they can't really read latin this this thing that um or speak for that matter this thing that latin was kind of sort of um, common language in the middle ages um for communication is not really true in in written culture absolutely uh, but again the degrees of you know latin proficiency were very different and especially the spoken one was like uh, you don't have to think it went close to to anything that this would be uh, to to anything common this would be particularly evident especially when the mendicant orders that came from the lower strata of the population often uh, were formed because those really couldn't speak latin right and at, at least let's say the carolingian reform uh, uh, maintained some degree of of aristocracy in the system so those were more likely to understand each other in latin independently from wherever they came from. So it's a bit like the elite always who is more international international in a way. But again, this was the very first step for that uniformity that nobody had taken before. And that survived and that continued. Mm -hmm. So there would be a lot of other things to say because definitely doesn't end here. But I think it's it's those concepts that it's worth the reflecting uh, on, if anything, for the consequences that they also have in today's world, and so that we are betrayed to take for granted, in a way. Civilization is never to be taken for granted. There is no such thing like being born in a civilization, just, you know, being magically advanced. No, you have to spit blood and sweat tears to to be a civilized person. Right, and these systems are that are educational ones are exactly the ones that that show that that you need to work, you need culture, you need education, you need competence, you need standards to make things work. Um, unlike modern tendency that is, you know, I do whatever I want, and everybody who imposes me standards is an oppressor, and everything collapses because, of course, nobody's capable to do anything anymore, which is exactly what we're witnessing right now with empty titles and forms and whatever but i would also argue that it's exactly the, the moment of of crisis in a sense that shows also it's it's best I mean, that would happen for the same reform at that point consider that the same reasons for which benedict was frustrated i mean benedict of Anian was uh, frustrated in his early monastic experience in the carolingian world is that of course uh, the there was already some kind of organization, some degree of uniformity. I mean, the, especially in Gaul, that was by far the most, the, you know, the, the most um, hierarchically organized and managed uh, area of the of the empire in terms probably of how much could be invested in single institutions, etc. Well, was um, albeit private, what was there. Right. The problem is that, uh, again, it was not uniform. 
it, it varied for especially those lands that were not uh, fully integrated in the Roman Catholic administrative system, the church and so on. Uh, it, it was also about properly the um, the how much was owed to the church as such, right, and not just private power that interfered right from the lay side, right. But mostly it was having robust in ecclesiastical institutions that could be useful for backing the, the, the empire and that wouldn't disgregate like the lay ones just after a few generations because of this constant splitting among the male heirs. And that thing during the second invasion worked because the Western monastic standards remained high and they actually developed further exactly in those times so it's um, it's fantastic because by the way monasteries as you know in the 10th century 9th 10th century was also they were also the, the favorite target of the second invaders and yet monks in that hell kept moving kept traveling from monastery to monastery sharing books the books manuscripts the foundation of civilization, knowledge, wisdom, the verbum, the logos, right? Um, this, uh, this is what makes that. And every civilization had understood that the pagan, the Christian one, it was about knowledge. And that knowledge was preserved and was shared and were all organized, was composed, was reflected upon, right? So that also maybe betrayed the most Spartan elements of, say, um, tendencies of and wishes of Benedict of Anian's reform that wanted to be as you know the Benedictine rule is quite crude in terms of it's about praying and working materially with your hands as you work with your spirit which is very important disciplinarily speaking right and perhaps that's exactly what made it even for later intellectual resources to be unleashed because um, to be unlocked because um, uh, if you don't have discipline you can't even study <laughs> right? it's not a matter of working or convincing yourself if you don't know how to work you, you don't know how to make an effort and how much it takes you can't even properly understand what standards are needed to make civilization work and civilization is based on reason and knowledge and science right that build up morality in the process all right F um, we will hopefully talk again about the Carolingian reform, um, etc. I'm I'm glad that, in a totally random way, in the last months we made videos about the Frankish, both Merovingian and Carolingian uh, church. Um, we talked about the geography. We observed the, the changes also. Uh, from the slight changes between Merovingian and Carolingian times is still important anyhow and also this crucial step of um, taken within the same Carolingian times uh, is uh, is again a bridge between the past and the future without which we would have missed great part of what we know as a Western civilization but for today here I uh, stop um, I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye